name is Brandon Bruce. I work in advancement and community relations uh, here at Maryland College. I want to welcome uh, most of your students. Welcome faculty, staff, uh, members of our board of directors, and uh, members of the community joining us today. Welcome to the Ronald and Linda Nutt Theater here in our relatively brand new Titan Center for the Arts. Uh, I want to also extend a special thanks to Ms. Elizabeth Mulet, a member of our board of directors. She uh, sparked the conversation that led to the invitation. Uh, of today's speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's keynote speaker for Perspectives on the Environment. Quick question, what would you do if the company you bought was losing a million dollars a month? That's the question Mr. Jeffrey Willis had to answer when he bought a company called Pretty Products in 2007. <coughs> what is Pretty Products? Raise your hand if you drive a Honda, Toyota, Subaru, Hyundai, one of those brand new electric Tesla motors vehicles. For those of you that do, you have pretty products uh, in your vehicle. Uh, they're headquartered on a 32-acre campus in, in the Range, Georgia, just down the road. Uh, they're the leading manufacturer of quality design floor, cargo, and trunk mats in the world. Mr. Willis bought the company, which was founded in 1929, five years ago at a time when it was struggling, losing about a million dollars a month. As a cornerstone of his turnaround strategy, he implemented environmentally friendly business practices and invested in innovative technology, including a patent pending product called Green Mat that is 100% recyclable. The company also found a way to recycle its raw materials, greatly reducing scraps into landfills and reducing the amount of rubber the company had been purchasing. <coughs> Supporting sustainability in other forms, Free Products has a three acre victory garden that is tended by executives and employees. Fresh vegetables from the garden are distributed for free to employees and needy families. On a, on a side note that I didn't include in my introduction, Mr. Willis' son is just a little bit taller than I am. Uh, he's 6'10", played basketball here for a couple years. For those of you, I know that most of you are freshmen, but for those of you that may be local that watch the basketball team. Yeah. A member of Maryland College's Board of Directors, please join me in welcoming the Chairman and CEO of Pretty Products, Mr. Jeffrey Willis. speaking 
uh, to the students somewhere in, in the fall, unless we're somewhere, I forget how many months ago, but it was wonderful of her to do that. It's the kind of leadership that she brings to the board and she makes things happen. So we worked hard to get ready for this. Uh, Dr. Roger Miller has been very good to uh, help us uh, kind of put together uh, what to expect. And we weren't sure what to expect, but uh, uh, he was very helpful in pointing out uh, what his classes were all about. And hopefully we could uh, make some kind of appeal. But I want to say something briefly too about Maryville. This is a wonderful institution to be a part of. It, it makes a difference in people's lives. Uh, their stretch of your mind uh, is really something not to take lightly because it really forces thinking out of the box and looking at capabilities that sometimes you don't even know you have yourself. And I'll share a story with you about that as we go forward. And to Dr. Bogart, who's uh, fresh leadership for the kind of times that we're in, we're in a difficult world with difficult challenges, and uh, you really can't take anything for granted uh, once you uh, extend yourself beyond the confines of the school and out of your parents' uh, environment and into the real world. And having to get real traction at uh, surviving and making a contribution to society. So I think Tom Bogart is the right kind of leader for this school, uh, following the great leadership of Gerald Gibson. So uh, feel good about being here at Maryville College because it's very, very important that you take full advantage of um, all it has to offer. Uh, I want to start by sharing a story with you about stretching your mind. Earlier, I guess it was sometime last year, I got a call from some of my Harvard classmates that live in Europe. And one of the things that they wanted me to consider doing was coming to Europe to play golf on some of the greatest golf courses that they said were open. And I'm not a great golfer, but I like the challenge. And these were Ryder Cup courses. They were different than anything that I had ever seen over here. They were far more difficult than anything that I thought that I could imagine playing on. So I left from Europe, got over there, and arrived, and immediately they took us to uh, one of these courses. And one of the courses that we played was called the European Club. It was supposed to have one of the most difficult golf terrains that anybody could ever want to imagine playing. So I get over there, we get to the course, and we get to this particular hole. And I can remember everyone said, you want to take a picture by this sign. And as I got to the sign, I said, wow, look at this. This hole says, you are about to play on one of the world's 100 greatest golf holes. There's millions of golf holes in the world. This was one of the world's 100 greatest golf holes. And I had to think about that. So I have this caddy with me, and we're all standing there. And he says, you know, this is a par five. Oh. And you can reach this green in two if you get two great shots. And I'm used to playing with my staff, Willie, and some of the guys that I'm over there in Europe. And I look around, there's no Willie, there's no anybody else. And I'm thinking about Maryville College and that whole stretch your mind aspect of it. And so I get up to hit, and lo and behold, my first drive was a magnificent drive. In fact, it was 403 yards. Now, I'm not a consistent golfer, but that ball was 403 yards from the street. The problem with the next shot is that you have to make a decision. Because around that magnificent hole, is an indication why it's one of the 100 greatest golf holes. There's a lake. And I'm not talking about a minor pond. There's a lake off a cliff and all of that. So I had to make a decision that, okay, I may 
mean in this forum, this whole, I've got an outside chance of getting up there too. If I really believe it, if Ronald Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Jasper Park, all these great golfers birdie this hole. So really, I, I can't possibly think that I'm going to. So I'm going back and forth and saying, well, maybe I'll just lay up. Won't take any chances. Uh, I don't want to get in the water because uh, I'm, I'm all the way over here. But I'll just play it safe. So I went back down the iron and the caddy tapped me on the shoulder and he says, well, Mr. Moore, let me ask you a question. And I said, sir, he said, how many times do you think you're ever going to play this golf course again? And how many times do you ever think that you're going to be on one of the 100 greatest golf holes in the world? And I thought about that, and I thought about the stretch of your mind scenario, and I grabbed the driver and I said, you're right. He said, go for it. And I heard this roar on the other side by my classmates, and that ball was six inches <laughs> from the hole. I eagled that ball beyond birdie. Jack Nicholas did eagle it, Arnold Palmer did eagle it. I didn't, I, it, was, it was an unbelievable day. It was almost ready to quit, and that was the fifth. 15th hole. And the point of that whole thing was it was a great challenge to play that course. It was even more of a challenge to stretch my thoughts that I can envision the possibility of accomplishing that. Day. Now, the other side of that story is I did finish, got back to the U.S. It was on a golf high got with Willie and the team, and we went out to one of the local courses. No, uh, who is it? Uh, Bob Jones? Who is it? Robert Trent Jones. And I stuck up the whole course. <laughs> and, and the reason that my mind had gone back to not stretching it, not challenging it myself, and trying to play it safe. So, I'll tell you the other side of the importance of that as I bring this to a close, but I want to give you some of the backdrop talk to you about pretty products because I know you're freshman students, you're not business professionals, you really aren't seeing the world like maybe I would have seen it differently as a freshman when I was in college and I had to get out of here and uh, make some things happen. But in making things happen, you are going to be faced with great challenges and great opportunities. And some of those challenges are going to be uh, chances to uh, change the world, make great improvements in your community, society, and really in yourself. This is Pretty Products. Pretty Products, as uh, these things point out, is certified ISO TS. Those are basic, excuse me, utility. Uh, those are basic certifications, but the ISO 14001 is an environmental certification that they had. And we sustained, I don't know if we had it since 1996, or do we have it now? So we, the company had it for years. And this sustainability strategy that we evolved to, uh, just, which is the only part of this that I might reference these notes to rest, but it's a real story so we can tell you about it, uh, was a part of an overriding rationale that we had to come up with. And to bring this point, what do you do when you have a company that's that far broken, that you envision some great opportunity for, and you have to come up with a compelling reason to make it have value? So, Becoming green by, by us is not just viewed as a corporate social responsibility. That was the first thought. The divorce from our business objectives, because we had business objectives that we... The belief that companies must choose between doing good and being profitable is outdated. That's a fact. 
They now have to understand that being accountable to our society and our environment is far more significant. And so when we look at the landscape of what's compelling to everybody, all of us, folks in China, folks in India, folks everywhere, is our environment. If we don't sustain our environment, we're not going to have any place to sustain our companies, and as a people, we won't sustain it. So that factored into our thoughts on creating something compelling for this company that was very broken. And then we had to look at the landscape of our community and say, our industry, what's going on in this industry that uh, we can find a way to come up with a compelling reason that if we fix this company, that we're going to have a way to sell it. Sell to our customers something that had a value proposition. So let me tell you about these products. This phase of these kinds of companies that were this severely broken uh, had this significant in terms of its challenge. Willie and I have dubbed it when stuff like this is going on, nothing goes right. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong, and it does go wrong. So we've done this to can't kill nothing, won't nothing die phase. And, and there were many times that we felt like that was just what was going to happen. Well, the company was founded in 1929 as a leading manufacturer of quality design floor mats, goggle mats, trunk mats, so on and so forth. And when I came upon the company, it had more employees than Maryville had students, which was 75% more employees than it needed. It had a very difficult union. It was an old technology. It was not sustainable. It had customers that had bad business models. And every other thing that a corporation needs to be productive was out of line. It had no culture and it really had no strategy. I had already had a company that had a great partnership. I had a partnership with a Tennessee company that I bought the majority of interest called Avantac. My partner was Magnet Corporation. I was in a very comfortable position. Uh, I owned 60% of a non-core plant that they had in Magnet that you may not be familiar with, is a $30 billion company with no debt. And all the technology and all of the engineering and every other technical that anybody would need to have from a partner, I had in a very comfortable position. But I was familiar with pretty products from the years that I started in manufacturing and um, the owner, who would never sell it to me over the years, had really grown and extracted all the value from so pretty was an enormous challenge. Finally, they decided to divest themselves of it. And I got a call from Goldman Sachs that said, we talked with the owners of Pretty Products. I understand that they want to sell the company. Are you interested? I said, yes. I went to Magna and said, I want to sell you back my 60% of the company. Which they were stunned. And they said, why? And I said, well, there's this great company that's been around since 1929. And the reason that I want it is that at one time it was a grand organization that owned a share of a market space. And if somebody bought it and innovated it, put strategy into it, it can reemerge as a leader in its space. That was a grand game plan at that time for me. So I bought it. This is our facility. It's now on the one roof in the grant. But let me go back to buying it in October of 2007. At the time that I bought the company, I had uh, plenty of capital fresh off of the deal from Magna that I used to invest in buying this company. The risk was it was my money. And if I didn't make it work, this stage of my life, I'd lose absolutely everything. 
absolutely everything. And I had to face the reality that I walked away from a $30 billion partner that was a leader in the automotive world that wanted to mention me as a part of their operation. Here's an important point. When you make a decision and you feel conviction about it, don't look back. You made it, you go forward, and you develop a commitment to figure out how to get value out of that process. And so we had this grand game plan at that time that we were going to take this company and do all of these great things with it. Environmental stuff wasn't even the standard. We didn't, you know, nobody had even thought about environmental sustainability at the time. And I grew up in New York. My daughter's here and my granddaughter's here. They are, they grew up here. But I grew up in New York, near Brooklyn, and one of my friends over the years was Mike Tyson. And most of you have probably heard of Mike. I know Mike. And the only prolific thing that Mike ever said, in my opinion, I wouldn't even tell him this to his face these days, was, Jeff, in my heyday, everybody that got in the ring with me had a game plan until they got hit. And once they got hit, they had to realize that this is what it's like to be in a heavyweight fight. And 2007 turned into the beginning of 2008, which was the beginning of a heavyweight fight that we would gladly fight like two and three times over than to go through those challenges. And here is what we did. In the first quarter of 2008, Pretty Products had old technology rubber. Rubber was no longer where the industry was going. Nobody wanted it. It was a dirty, nasty process that was expensive and tied into petroleum, so you could not control your costs. When things that were beyond your control happened, you were just subject to it. The problem with that is that you had customers like General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, which was this company's most significant customers. And there was nothing you could do to pass that cost on to them. And with no strategy in your own organization, all you could do was gut it back and take the losses. So we walked into that. In the first quarter of the year, when 2008 began to unravel, petroleum prices stopped. So raw materials were not even move. And all of a sudden, we had the first blow in this heavyweight fight that said, what in the world are we going to do to avert this? Go to your customers, try and pass the cost on. That wasn't an option with General Motors and Ford and Chrysler because they were going under. And they were significant parts of this, custom, of this company's customer base. So we knew at that time we had to exit old technologies, exit customers that we had been with for 50 years, and try and innovate this factory under one roof. So we embarked upon a plan to shut these factories down, while all of this financial calamity was going on in the first quarter, come up with a strategy to say, we've got to be compelling. What's compelling? Where's the industry going? And so we moved from the first quarter of 2008 to the middle of 2008, and the second round of the heavyweight fight started, and the credit market dried up. You couldn't get raw materials. You couldn't get credit. Your suppliers couldn't get credit. And yet you had some orders coming in from customers that you couldn't get out. All the while, we were trying to shut factories down, come up with an idea, come up with a strategy to get the company going. Willie and I developed a strategy that we didn't know was going to be later chronicled, and I'll talk about that to say what we think is compelling is green and sustainability. Everybody is sensitive to that now. Every corporation has a sense of corporate government, governance, every organization, including this university, uh, the college has it. And how does this relate to where maybe some of you are now and 
what you may be facing in time. Well, it's hard to tell the freshman class about Frederick Walker's drawing up and the serious impact that could have on them because you're insulated from a lot of this because you're not in the credit market. You, uh, if you're something like my kids were, your parents were standing for what you had to deal with. But here's what could have happened and here's what your parents probably realized. If they were in business and they had aspects of their business tied into that economy, they could have lost the business, they could have lost the tools necessary to produce things that were viable, and sooner or later, that would have tripled down to their ability to sustain even you. It was that tough. And while right now that doesn't resonate with you guys, if you were out there in that challenge, you would have seen it. We stuck with a game plan and said, we're going to return this company to profitability by March of 09 or else. So we came up with uh, technology. And technology for us was that we had something to work from there. Pretty Products was the only company that had all three uh, processes to manufacture floor mats. But we wanted to do more than just manufacture floor mats. We had competitors that were just manufacturing floor mats. And competing on the basis of operational efficiencies was not enough. Because that meant that all you were doing was trying to get yours there more on time than theirs, or with less quality issues than theirs. And so all of a sudden, you're just competing on commodity. And commodity is driven by price. And if that's all that you're going to compete on, there's no value proposition to your end user, your customer. So we had to do something more. So we built on what they had and devised products for Toyota, Subaru, Honda, Nissan, and others that were not just floor mats. These products were floor mat solutions. They weren't regular floor mats anymore because part of our strategy and the reason they're compelling is important, if your customer who drives strategy has an absolute reason to be interested in your product, then you certainly have an increased opportunity to sell it. So there were issues going on in our industry that we felt that we could uh, be of value to. Then we developed a line of all season floor mats and those are the used to be rubber, we innovated them to be something called thermoplastic. Last reason I have really talked about those. We did it for cargo mats for Lexus and Toyota and Subaru and, and more the lot. And then the last quarter of 2008, the real devastating blow hit and the global economy collapsed. So while we were in the middle of trying to fix this company that was severely broken, we had the world falling apart around us. And the real question is, what do you do now when you're faced with those kind of challenges in the midst of everything else that you're trying to do to sustain and create value, to protect jobs, we had workers, people's lives, people's destinies were tied into my strategy, their destiny was tied into my destiny. They had kids in college. I had kids in college. They had homes and all of the stuff that we were trying to sustain while all of the world was falling apart. We had to make a commitment to go forward. I couldn't lay up. I couldn't worry about whether or not everything was surrounded by lakes and trenches and wars and all the stuff that was going on. I had to stay focused on the commitment and the conviction and a sense of purpose that what do great companies do? And great companies try and evolve themselves to bring value to society. They try to come up with strategies that's going to uh, improve the world. And there were so many benefits of going sustainable and green that we had to stay on that theme. And part of that was we had to bring in new innovative equipment at a time that nobody was financing any equipment in America. 
much less than the other mobile states. And I looked at Willard, he looked at me, and he said, well, look, we have to get this done. So while the difficult takes time, the impossible will just take us a little longer. Because we have to get these machines in here, and we did. So we brought in two new state-of-the-art injection molding machines. We had them installed. We did all the electrical in the factories ourselves. And lo and behold, innovation in green drove cost out of our business so that we could finance ourselves through the most difficult time and stay on track to return to profitability for this company in seven or eight years. Purdy Products at one time was a $260 million company, just to give you some perspective on what was at stake here. And then we put initiatives in place that were more important than just returning the company to profitability and coming up with innovative products to drive value and to drive strategy and all of that stuff. The stuff that was most important to us were the things that were affecting people's lives and that we were uh, going to be great champions of uh, the proletariat, the working class folks who are oftentimes not touched when all of these things go on but have to rely on organizations and companies of all size to create opportunity and sensitivity toward what's most important in life and certainly most important to us. And we came up with a number of initiatives in our company in the worst of times when we felt that uh, we could make a difference. And at this phase, in the horrific challenge of getting through 2008, shuttering factories, exiting customers, we uh, got out of General Motors and Ford and Chrysler. I'm glad that they were nationalized and uh, surviving. But we had to escape to the stable segment of the market, which were the new domestics. And we got out by finally asking them to leave two months or so before they filed bankruptcy. Had we stayed the course and felt that we could weather that storm with them, I certainly wouldn't be here on this stage and a hundred plus people's lives would have been impacted because we'd have lost the company. We had to make a decision and make a conviction about that decision develop a strategy to face a great challenge, an enormous challenge, with every single thing at risk, every single day, to get to the other side. In some ways, that question that that golf caddy asked me, I'll ask you at the end of this. Because all of you, whether you're freshmen now, or guests that are here, even some of my board colleagues that are learning and fine people. When you're faced sometimes with great challenges, there are also great opportunities if you're committed. And you have a vision and a plan that makes sense. You can evolve through it, even though there are, were a few days, more than a few, that I'd walk into that factory with all of the family going on and say to bully the staff, cut the gloves. That's enough. Well, I'm going to let you talk about the social sustainability aspect of our company and those initiatives that did this. But before I bring Bully up, I want to talk about him. We have a good time feeding off of each other and the energy that we have in the factory. Everybody picks me about being at Harvard, and we've got folks that are graduates of Auburn and Alabama, and these are fine schools in the regional world that we have. We don't have any American graduates, so we want to leave the door open for those graduates that are bold enough to take real risks and real challenges. You can lead people, but they have to have a desire to follow you. As we went through this evolution, acquiring a company, our employees uh, finding themselves, we, we were 
closing plans, exiting business. We had to find a way to motivate the people. Being a new employee when I went in in December of 07, uh, I, I learned, a, uh, I used the life lesson that I learned. People don't really care what you know until they know that you care. And that's a very important lesson that someday you will learn. Hopefully you have a learned. Get into the plan, I'm a new fellow. Uh, I've got to start talking about downsizing, shutting down some business, transforming a plant from a work-in process operation into a single-piece workflow, putting in lean manufacturing activities, and people are looking at me like I'm from Mars. Does this guy know we're making floor mats? We've been in this forever. You can't teach us anything new. Uh, so I started to spend a lot of time with all three of the shifts just to get to know the people. Realized that several of the people that worked uh, at the plant, either their sons, their daughters, their husbands, their wives, were serving in the military. So in February of 08, we started what we called Red Shirt Fridays. Red Shirt Fridays was to honor those people within the, the military. It wasn't a war support one way or another. It was to support those that were giving their time to, to provide us with our freedoms. So we had the Red Shirt Fridays. To this day, almost four years later, when you walk in the plant on a Friday, you'll see red shirts for our employees and for those folks. Uh, I'll accept the maintenance. We've got a busy somewhere today. Um, we have an annual 9-11 service. <coughs> okay. That's all. We have an annual 9-11 service. On 9-11, we invite the local firefighters uh, to come into the plant. We wear our red shirts. We have a devotional uh, activity. We have a big uh, barbecue for these folks, and we do it every year tragic event that happened to us that we just don't want to lose sight of. So we do that. It's, it's very well received within the community. And now at, at the events, we have people come from within the community just to help participate. About every month at our plant, we cook for all of our employees. Boston Bob's hamburgers for all three shifts so that we can send and get to know one another understand what the needs are and communicate to everyone on a very personal level. And understand, when you run a company, it still is personal. Our greatest asset are the individuals who walk through that facility every day. So we talked about our three-acre garden, community garden. Um, when Jeffrey and I were going through this and all of our team, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of stress that you have. But we felt like we needed to get out, we needed to, to do something. I live in the Carolinas, I've got a little garden. So everybody said, well, I'm going to go out and turn over the dirt. Uh, we had a lot of extra land, and of course, at first people thought, well, this was crazy. So we turned over three acres of ground. Uh, as we started turning it in the fall, the next spring, we got out. You'll notice the one with the hat is Jeffrey. You'll notice that they've got my worst side uh, here. Uh, this is Jeffrey and I. This was, this was all of our employees. We got out and planted it. And as Jeffrey said, coming from just outside of Brooklyn, when I gave him the hoe, he wasn't sure which end to use. So, well, I'm just telling you. So we dropped the seeds in the ground. And he said, do they grow? And I said, no, we've got, we got to fertilize them. We've got to cover them. We've got to nurture them. And then we'll pick it. He thought we'd, they'd be ready to eat the next week. They didn't come out in cans. Uh, we didn't plant the book. Yeah, yeah. So this was uh, motivating for me as well. But some of our employees, it's, it's very important. These are our employees with us. During after hours activities, we found that once we got this started, some people were driving by, hey, what's that? I had a fellow come by 80 years old and dropped me by a couple of topsy-turvy tomato plants. 
you had people from a local feed store start donating corn and tomatoes, and so there started to be energies and synergies being developed to help motivate the community to help support us. I, I want to say something further here about this garden. This uh, garden that we deemed our victory garden. We started this garden that was in 2008 when it just seemed like everything in the world was going wrong. And the only right thing that we really felt good about was doing something for uh, the community, um, that region, and the greater good that this garden did. This garden feeds 1,100 and 60 semi families in that community every year, and it's growing. And what it has done is embolden the region around the reality that breeding a company meant more than just uh, evolving green products because uh, this has had far reaching effects, even more so than we ever thought. Uh, and while we next year, I think we have some plans to uh, expand it. So from eating too much out of the garden, uh, we have a very seasoned workforce, as you can imagine, uh, at our facility. Uh, Jeffrey was uh, a long-time friend with a gentleman by the name of Lee Haney. Lee Haney is an eight-time Mr. Olympia, uh, shortly after Arnold Schwarzenegger was held that position. Uh, we coordinated with Lee. We set up a training facility uh, at the plant. We offer training, uh, wellness training. Lee came in developed a very thorough plan for us as individuals and as groups to get in place. Uh, we offer our data to both uh, second and first shift employees. We had a lot of turnout. We lost a lot of uh, wagon activities. Uh, our, our, our consciousness about who we were was improved through this wellness facility. And to expand on that some, a healthy workforce is a more motivated workforce, and pretty products have never had that. And when you're trying to build a company from the bottom up, again, you look at all factors that affect cost. And with a healthier workforce, we found that our healthcare costs went down significantly because folks had less issues with blood pressure and cholesterol, and they were more attentive to their health. So it was a driver, in a sense, that uh, helped us bring value to uh, what we were trying to do in this overall fixing the, the company. Now, I'm going to take this one because Al Clapper started with Pretty Products before I was born in April of 1959. He's been with us 50 plus years and he's still a vibrant part of that workforce who bought a lot of legacy of ideas and foundation. Uh, go back to that for a second. The only problem I have, uh, we gave out a recognition that day because the local newspapers and others were so fascinated that a worker who's been there through half the company's life, more than half the company's life, is still there. Uh, the problem I have with Al is that Al looked like that in 1959 when he came to work there, and that always concerns us because there's a photo of Al uh, in 1959, and uh, I think now he's 70, somewhere 72, 73, but uh, whatever he's eating from that plant that preserves him, uh, it did him injustice in 1959 to look like that, but he still looks like that. So. Uh, now we get to uh, some of the green spatter. Now we've been through all of the awful stuff of taking the worst hits the worst adjustments, sticking to our plan, and now putting products is no longer not profitable. We turned we turn to profitability in March of 2009. We've been profitable ever since from losing more than a million dollars a month. A million dollars a month is a lot of money to lose. That's money that you either invest in it, or you find it, or you borrow it. And at the end of the day, you can't borrow yourself out of debt. So what were we going to do to, to reinvigorate the company? We came up with innovative strategy, green products. This format, when it's at its full tilt, you'll be able to take it at the end of the day in its useful life and drop it off in a recycling bin and it can be recycled back into reusable products. And the value of that is that it's 23% lighter 
So as a result of which, federal standards that call for increased fuel efficiency means that car companies have to take weight out of the vehicles and every pound you take out increases fuel efficiency. So all of a sudden this appeals to more than just the mass society that wants green sustainable products. It also provides itself toward a solution. If you can recall earlier I said that we were going to innovate products. These are no longer regular floor mats that you see in vehicles that come out of pretty products. They're not rubber based, they're not petroleum tied into the company has evolved to one factory with new equipment under one roof with all new innovative products that have some compelling desire for the customer or to the end user. This particular mat, although it looks like a regular floor mat, is a real innovative product. There's nothing glamorous or exciting about it, and that's why it's hard for maybe you to grasp. But here's the importance of this. We saw an issue with a customer who had a problem with sudden acceleration. Not to name the customer, but unfortunately, somebody lost their lives in a vehicle because the floor mat got jammed in the accelerator. As a result of which, a family lost their life. Just one loss of life is critical. And what happened here was that that customer was confounded with the challenges of this reality that brought enormous and negative, uh, they lost market share, they lost market cap, they had profits lost. It cost them millions and millions, I would say, if not billions of dollars, based on the fact that they had a commodity floor mat in their vehicle that caused this kind of calamity for the company. We saw that, and we saw an opportunity for us to do what we had envisioned to reformat this company to do and respond to it. That mat's counterintuitive. When you step on that mat, instead of going forward, it goes the other way. It never allows the floor mat to accede forward and ever be a threat to the accelerator. So it's not a floor mat, it's a floor mat solution. So all of a sudden, Pretty Products is now under one roof, a green company, contributing to its community, contributing to its environment, opening up new market segments, and developing a line of state-of-the-art products that have compelling value. And when a product has compelling value, a customer is willing to pay more for it, although we have it priced competitively. Here's what happens. If you got it priced here, and your customer buys it here, and this man is so compelling to the customer that it solves that problem that they had with sudden acceleration, then they're going to sell more of these mats. And that space between here and here, guess what, is going to be your product, so you're also selling more. And this product offers a variety, as do the others. They are sustainable, they're recyclable, and there are so many value propositions to the products that come out of the factory now that it's uh, lent itself for us to have what's called next practices. You don't make floor mats any other way now. It would be like me walking in here with back in the days when I was your age, we had what was called eight tracks. You guys have these iPads and all that. You couldn't even imagine having this. The devices that we used back in my days to listen to music was about the size of that floor mat. And we stuck it in the side of this big box and we walked, didn't even have headphones making all that noise. And nowadays, those innovative products that you have or the next practices. What we've developed here is the next way to make floor mats. You don't even make them that way anymore. Now, it would be irresponsible for any company in the world to not sooner or later follow the path that we've taken with green, sustainable products. And all that really take it from here to kind of explain it, because you're going to lose some of these other people, because this is, I hope not. Talk to them about some of the processes that we've had to go through okay. to do that. 
what you see here uh, in, in the past, they used to make floor mats. A lot of the floor mats were made out of synthetic rubbers. So what Willie's holding up is the cutout of when these mats come off the line, this part's cut out so they can go through further process. This part here was thrown in the landfill. In our company alone, we were throwing 700 tons of that product in landfills every year. This machine allowed us to figure out a way to reprocess that whole back into reusable resin. Now the power of that is that resin is an important part of the process to make floor mats. In green and sustainable floor mats, you have to remove latex, you have to come up with something that's going to create an innovation so you can take cost out. This machine paid for itself in how many months? Four? Ten months. And uh, we paid for it out of our pocket and uh, it has reaped enormous benefits for us. It's called an NGR machine. And this finished the next practice part of making floor mats. So all of a sudden, Pretty Products is now not in old technology, not with new uh, old customers. It doesn't have old equipment. It certainly has culture and it certainly has a strategy. But it has a line of products now that are in demand by any automaker. Sooner or later, it would be irresponsible for any automaker, whether you're in China or India or the US, to not have products that contribute constructively to the environment. So we've gone the whole gamut with fixing the company to the extent that everything in it now, from top to bottom, has value. And as we create value for the company, our customers, for instance, like Toyota, with just one line of their products with these green mats, say the camera. The landfill savings to Toyota just to have camera mats would be half the size of the US space shuttle in landfill savings. That's just one platform. Toyota has 20 platforms. General Motors has more than that. And so if you take that as a multiplier effect across the automotive industry, and all of a sudden, us regular folks who had some determination and conviction to survive have created the foundation of products that have the power to change the world. Our strategic objective, and I don't know, hopefully you can at least understand some of the importance of strategic objective because this was critical. What's the first thing you have to do when you try to develop a strategy? You've got to see what you're up against. What's going on in your market space? What's going on in the world? Whether you're in college, colleges trying to develop strategies to create more compelling reasons the students go there, they have to understand what the market is and how they size up in that market. So we had to go through all of this analysis ourselves to say what's the truck market, what's the car market, what's the percentage of sales increases by customer, who's doing what, Honda, Toyota, BMW, Honda, VW. And look at the volumes that these customers have. All of this went into our effort to determine where is the market going? GM, although bailed out, they are moving along, Ford's moving along, Chrysler, this is the big three. The big three seems to have new life. Toyota, Nissan, Honda, Hyundai, VW, BMW, all these have lots of market spaces but different compelling reasons that we might want to introduce this line of products to them. And then you have to size yourself up against your competition. These are all competitors, what they have, their strengths, their weaknesses, and in the whole final effort in this analysis, you want to find your sweet spot. What can you do that they can't? And what can you do better? And what are you doing that differentiates you from them that's going to allow you to have a competitive advantage? In our case, green and the price that we paid to get into green, our competitors have not. Not in exclusion not in injection mode.
they had some strengths, they had some weaknesses, but we had broad based strength because we didn't lay up and took the bold approach to develop this line of products that were going to be compelling to the industry. At the end of the day, you come up with a strategy wheel. Now this is a business tool that is far more than you maybe need to understand, but maybe conceptually you'll understand what we have done. Remember earlier I said Pretty Product was a broken company. No two divisions were working together in one uh, path, no two departments were working together. And what I did with the help of my staff was come up with one compelling strategy for the company. What was our strategy? To increase market share to 10% of the OEM North American floor mat business by offering sustainable green and solution driven products. Green mats, floor mats that were no longer floor mats anymore, but floor mat solutions. And how do I achieve that? I had to bring every single one of our departments in line with this strategy. So whether you're working in finance, finances responsibilities drive that strategy. Marketing responsibility drives that strategy. Manufacturing drives that strategy. Procurement drives that strategy. This would be big stuff at, at Harvard. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that they teach at Harvard and other places. This is real world stuff. This is how it works. And so, what do we do? Now everybody here is driving that. Nobody comes in with products that have nothing to do with the overall strategy. Everybody's in one alignment. The whole company now is working on that central thing which brings value. The company's goals and vision. Everybody in this strategic wheel does that. So that decision helps that group, which helps that group, which helps that group, which helps that. So it's all now working in one constructive path. Maybe later at some point in time in your careers when you maybe vaguely recall this, this is a very important, very powerful tool for whether you're at this college or any organization that says everybody has to have a strategy to achieve its objective and everybody in the organization has to be working in alignment with that strategy. And that's what this is all about. Now, how do we know it's working? Pretty Products hadn't won any new business in four or five years prior to me buying the company. And up until the point in time that we had a make sense strategy past 2008, improved ourselves as a world class supplier. We had not until now. And we are now finding ourselves in compelling demand with these products for automakers all over again who have sustainability as a part of their objective and recently awarded programs even in new market segments have been important. This is a golf cart that's not an automobile obviously. The club car is a major manufacturer of golf carts and one of their interests was in green and sustainability. And this part of golf carts were made of rubber. Golf carts are generally uh, powered through electricity. And uh, they came to us after hearing that we had developed these sustainable products and they wanted to know if there was a way that we could create some value. Why well, don't you show them here? What? And, and this is even more important than the automotive space because this tells the story of what innovation and greening and sustainability can do. This is how it used to be. And nothing glamorous about it. It's a heavy piece of rubber to cover the floor. This is our impression design for this, which is uh, sustainable. Now, Club Call bought into changing this line of golf carts to this. But here's the most important part of this. <coughs> this product were made in 12 different factories in China. Those manufacturing jobs were in China, supplying club car and 
from the Far East that were making these vehicles right there in Augusta, Georgia. So by innovation and greening our company, we were able to bring jobs offshore back to the U.S. And all of those factories that were making that in China no longer make it. We do. Right here in Georgia, employing people right here in this country in real time, real manufacturing jobs. So this club car market segment was important to open up. Uh, maybe some of the young people might, especially the guys, might find this pretty groovy. This is a, uh, a recent award. This is Subaru's new sports car. Hit the market, actually priced pretty decently. 21 grand. I mean, this is a great vehicle they're making in conjunction with Toyota. And it's Subaru's new entry into the sports car market. And lo and behold, we manufacture sustainable products. The floor mats will come from our factory for the Subaru BRZ. The Subaru Crosstrack. New markets are coming. New customers are coming. We're winning new awards. This is another award that uh, will have green and sustainable products. And, and you'll notice as we go through this, uh, Subaru seems to be one of the companies that have a real interest and compelling interest in it because Subaru is a green company. They have no landfill uh, in any of their factories and everything that they make is green. And how has that benefited Subaru? Even in the downturn in the automotive industry, Subaru sales were stable and growing. And every car that they have coming across their assembly lines is already sold. They don't build any inventory. That's how compelling green is for them. Uh, the Subaru Forester, this is a recent one. We just won that the Tuesday of last week. It's a significant product. Uh, electric car vehicles. Coda is going to be launching next month. It's a new electric car company that's being made in California. It's a, Electric car companies want green, sustainable products, lighter weight mats that we're making products for those now. Uh, this is a pretty sharp model too. This is Tesla's new Model S all-electric car. It's an expensive car. This car is about $92,000. But the weight factor in electric cars is very important. And so we have tapped into the electric car market. And I think you said that they have standing orders for this. This cost $100,000 and they sold out 6,500 of them already before they even hit the streets. Those products will also have green and sustainable products. So overall, our cost structure is lower due to our sustainable strategy along with our lean manufacturing practice. Everything in our plant is efficient now. Kaizen is in place. Our extrusion waste is recycled in a reusable resin called EcoGrind, which we showed you an example of. Uh, is then needed into our extruded process, and as we said earlier, we are our fourth largest supplier. Um, before we get to questions and comments, I want to just kind of overall what happened to Pretty Promise. We went in faced with the challenge of a terrible, terribly um, broken company, and the risk of not coming up with a strategy that was going to be compelling enough that we can create value for that company moving into the market space, both locally and globally. I don't think my own family knew the extent of the enormous risk and challenges of coming up with a way to fix this company. And through this whole talk, I was saying, how do you really get this point across to these young people who are not business people yet, they're great minds waiting to evolve. How does this impact them? How, I mean, you, if I were talking to them, the classmates at Harvard or out on the business thing, they would understand strategy wheels and they would think it's a brilliant strategy. In fact, it's being considered to be made a case study, the Pretty Products journey for the business school. But how does this really impact you young folks who are bright minds, in a great institution like Marigold that's motto is stretch your mind. And I can only think of it this way. Just as that caddy tapped me on the shoulder at that great golf hole and said, how many times do you think you're going to 
be over here playing this called Holding a Lifetime. I think the question that I have for you is, how many times do you think you're going to live this lifetime? And if you can answer like the rest of us, and that's once. When you see a great challenge and a great opportunity to expand, go for it. Because you may stumble across something or, something or evolve something from your teachings or your learning or your life that will do what we have done. And the reverberating effects of what we have done uh, is still a journey for us. New markets to conquer, new opportunities to, to evolve to. And you too have the power to change the world as we're endeavoring to do, but most importantly, sustainability, innovation, and commitment to your community and the environment overall will bring value that you haven't really even seen yet. Um, we want to open it up for some questions. I know it might be tough to ask the right kinds of questions about some technical aspects. So if you have any questions that you simply want to ask about risk, challenges, life, ups, downs, hurdles, heartaches, and the assortment thereon. We could probably answer that because we lived it. And uh, we didn't want this to be a speech because this is what we did. And in many ways, when you go out beyond the confines of your parents' world and this great institution, you're going to be faced with opportunities to expand your careers wherever they may be. And in that journey to do that, you're going to face some real world challenges. And you too will have to come up with an idea, a strategy, a model, or figure out how you can bring some compelling value to whoever you're employed by or whoever you're trying to appeal to so you can advance those careers and opportunities. So I think in closing, that's my question. You're only going to come through this life but once. And when you're faced with those kinds of challenges like we were, where everything is at risk, uh, you're going to have to be creative and out of the box. Where you're going to have to stretch your mind. But in the case of this kind of stuff, my best advice to you is that don't, don't try this at home. Because this will certainly be something that you don't want to do twice in a lifetime. And the journey continues. And unexpected to even my staff, and I'll get with uh, Dr. Miller on this, we decided that uh, at the behest of the privilege of coming to talk to uh, a freshman class here, we wanted to, one, come back in four years, but in the meantime, we're going to make a pledge to the college on behalf of the studies in this area of $25,000 so that the students and Dr. Miller and us can work together to see how that money can be best used to help you and your classmates and the department evolve sensitivity, sustainability, and the environment and just life's challenges. Uh, we're going to work with them as well to open up our factories to factory, to possible internships, visits, discussions, and input from you that can help us improve, come up with new ideas, and you never know where those opportunities can lie. So uh, having said that, uh, if there's any questions for Willie and I, we'd be happy to try to address them. I know some of this was technical in nature. We really tried to not make it that, but you know, that's just what happened. I mean, you've got to talk about the processes. But maybe in that, there's a five or something that might help you in some challenge that you might have. So um, if that, if anybody wants to uh, ask us anything about this, we'd be happy to try and answer it.